a common question I get from clients is like, can you get me in Forbes? And it's, it's like asking me, like, it's like saying I've never been to a gym, but you know, can you get me into the Olympics? So I think that the, the main thing I'm trying to say is that it is kind of a long game. You have to build your fundamentals. You have to build relationships with reporters generally to, to kind of build a really strong PR campaign or, or program out there. Welcome back and excited for another conversation. In today's episode, we are going to be talking about crafting a PR strategy in Southeast Asia and how to really build and maintain that strong brand reputation. And very excited to be joined by Peggy Wu, the founder and managing director of Milkfish. And maybe just to kick things off, Peggy, it would be great if we could begin just with a quick introduction of yourself and uh, yeah, some of the work you do in the region. Yeah, so thanks so much for having me. Um, just a quick elevator pitch about myself. Uh, I'm Peggy. I uh, started a company called Millfish, with, which does communications consultancy for tech and finance companies. I actually do have a client sitting in the audience today. Um, I guess taking a step back, I've been in the region for over 14 years now, originally from New York. I've had the honor and privilege of working across three markets so far. China, Hong Kong, and Singapore uh, have worked with some really awesome clients, both large and small. And uh, part of my role is helping them build their PR strategies to ultimately help them scale and build their reputation in the region. So that's a quick intro. Awesome. Didn't realize you were a fellow New Yorker. So (laughs) (laughs) nice to have that in common. Um, Always. But would love to maybe to kick things off. It'd be great to, you know, think about how you understand the media landscape and in and, and the context of uh, PR strategies and in particular, of course, without naming any names, but would be curious to know. I mean, if you want to name names, you can name names. I can, I can name, I can name some <laughs> You can names. name some names, yes, yes. <laughs> I guess some of it will probably be public knowledge, in which case it's fine. Uh, but would, would love to hear uh, what PR mistakes have you seen organizations okay. make when trying to... So this oh. is like a three, four-parter. So we'll start with the, the first part, right, which is what, what does the media landscape look yeah. like? So when it comes to media landscape, um, especially here in Asia, it's quickly evolving so fast, even... Every other day, I'm getting news that there's another layoff in the media. Uh, From Yahoo Singapore, they just laid off a bunch of people. There's been a lot of movement. Um, It's hard to keep track, but what is very common across all of that is that uh, reporters are getting a bit more stretched. Uh, A lot of people are actually moving into my industry, PR. Uh, (laughs) So it's just becoming increasingly consolidated and... What that means for us as PR practitioners is that we really have to be very sharp in how we present our client, the story that they want to tell, um, and hope that they are able to accept our pitch. But there are nowadays more efforts, I think, more proactive efforts into also uh, creating our own content, which I think the last episode was about, creating our own content to get our news and our message out there as well. Just to double click on it with an example uh, that you've seen in terms of uh, an organization, maybe what went right and what went wrong uh, in terms of actually that, you know, launching that PR strategy. Well, this is a bit self-serving, but could we use Glint? Yeah, no, I have <laughs> no issue with that from my perspective. This is a very important client of mine. Yeah. Um, we've done a lot. I've, I've worked with them for a few years now. Actually, they were one of the first clients um, that gave me a bit of work, so I'm very, very grateful for them. And one thing that I really, truly valued about relationship is that we're able to sit down and actually map out who we care about. So in terms of like developing a really strong media strategy, we first need to sit down and map out like who do we care about? And so for Glintz, oftentimes it's working with the employers and the talent. But within employers, you can even further segment it. In Hong Kong, who are the employers that we do care about? Are they startups? Are they SMEs? Are they both? What percentage split? And then the more specific we can get, the more specific our, and, and effective our communication strategy can get. So, for example, with Flint's, like if we're trying to do something in Hong Kong and the focus is on uh, local employers, we might try to do a bit of work with the SCMP or Hong Kong Economic Times, Hong Kong Economic Journals to kind of get the story out. And then following that is working with the client really closely on developing what that story is, what are the examples and use cases that that we can talk about. Ultimately, it's like, why should you speak with Flint versus the other guys out there? Because uh, for, 
fortunately and unfortunately for Glintz, it's not the only player out there. So one thing that we do need to figure out is like, how do we differentiate them mm. from other players? And how do we tell a really good story off the back of that? Yeah. And once you've identified that market in terms of actually building the right set of relationships and particularly when you're trying to get the word out quickly, uh, how do you go from, okay, we have the right strategy to now, okay, we got to get the word out quickly in terms of what we're trying to do? Yeah, so I think a, a common question I get from clients is like, can you get me in Forbes? <laughs> like, yes. They're like, starting wanna, to... everyone, everyone's obsessed with Forbes yeah. or TechCrunch if they're a, a tech client. Mm. And it's it's like asking me like, it's like saying I've never been to a gym, but you know, can you get me into the Olympics? <laughs> it's it's really a long game. So you don't invest in PR if you want to get into a Forbes like ASAP. There are exceptions. Um, I I always said there there was one exception, but now I have two. So one exception is if you're invested by or partnering with Elon Musk or Jack Ma or someone high profile like that. Like, I can sell that story. Um, the second one is if if you're in a crisis. I don't know if you guys saw the story, like, I think a few months ago where a guy con uh, congratulated his employee for rehoming his dog because he had to go back into the office. So he had to... <laughs> <laughs> and nobody knew about this random company in, like, I don't know, Ohio or whatever in the U.S., but it made... Like, we saw it here in Asia. So that that's the second way. Not advisable. Um, so I think that the, the main thing I'm trying to say is that it is kind of a long game. You have to build your fundamentals. You have to build relationships with mm. reporters generally. To, to kind of build a really strong PR campaign or, or program out there. Yeah, and, and so amidst that long game and as a, you know, what I'm hearing is that sometimes clients might come and it, almost it sounds like in some sense unrealistic about what they might want to achieve in the first, you know, in the first few moments, which most of my career has been in professional services, so I'm used to those unrealistic expectations. But what would you say amidst actually... Um, you know, thinking about that long game, particularly, how would you encourage clients to really study the market or work with alongside them to understand, you know, here's a more uh, viable pathway to getting these results that you're looking for? Yeah, I think um, part of it is it's both of us do have homework, a very strong client PR exec ex uh, relationship is when we're both working really hard at it. It's not that, the, you know, you hire someone to help you with your PR and they're going to do 90% of the work. It's it's really, maybe we do a bit more of the heavy lifting, but we can only work with what you give us in a lot of ways. So um, a good example, uh, because this podcast is very focused on uh, cross-border or kind of launching here in Southeast Asia, a recent project I worked with on uh, with a private equity fund called Soraya Partners. It's an infrastructure fund. They've done zero, zero PR. Um, so you know, when they come to you, they're like, we want to launch, we want to be known, but they don't necessarily know like the steps to do it. So we're kind of like doctors where we talk to them and we kind of figure out what their value. It's a buzzword, but it, it really is something we try to nail down and articulate. Like, what is your value proposition? What makes you stand out from all the other infrastructure funds out there? Give me examples, Asia specific examples. So we're looking at this market. Um, what are some uh, examples that you can give us of your traction of the projects that you're working on so that we are able to build a really strong story. Um, and this particular project was to talk about or get the news out about their fundraising. They raised one of the highest um, funds of infrastructure funds here in Southeast Asia. So what was really helpful was that we had a CEO that was very much willing to practice, to be media trained. Um, we had a really good support team, the portfolio team, that was really helpful in getting us information about the different companies that they've invested in. And uh, we also had my partner in crime on the other side who was up at all hours trying to get information we needed, sign-offs that we needed, because one thing that really helped us, okay, this is another exception, but for their very first PR launch, we were able to get them on Bloomberg TV, CNBC, Reuters, because we were able to name one of their investors uh, BlackRock. So if you're able to have like a really high profile investor or partner that we can name, it really helps and goes a long way in getting you that coverage early on. So that's, that's one example I can think of. Okay. Yeah. And uh, w what about the role of local partners in terms of getting the word out, in terms of building that reputation, just in taking it from one market to basically expanding into other markets? So could you, you share a little bit about what that looks like for a client to make sure that they're in front of the right people? 
Yeah, and sometimes um, when we're working with startups and even SMEs, like one of the biggest constraints is budget and also resources. So I think for most of the people in the room here, we don't actually have the budget and resources to, to employ like a full scale <clears throat> influencer program. So oftentimes, like I think or I advocate that some of your biggest influencers or your ambassadors is actually like your employees like look inward. Is there anyone that's actually very good? Because, you know, a lot, even with Glitz, like there's a lot of millennials, Gen Z that works within the organization. The C-suite is made up of that kind of generation. So like, are they able to help us get the word out? Can we build programs, uh, advocacy programs off the back of it? So I think that's one like simple tactic that those that might have re- um, budget constraints or re- resource considerations can think of in terms of building that out. Um, outside of that, like partnerships, it depends, right, in terms of like what the agenda is. So sometimes we do partner, like, for example, uh, shameless plug for the Southeast Asia Talent Report for Glintz. But one of the partners uh, was Monks Hill Ventures, which is one of the investors for Glintz. So working with them in tandem um, to figure out, like, how to share resources, how to create content that works for both parties. So I think part of our role is also kind of sitting down uh, with a drawing board and figuring out, like, who are some of the low-hanging food partners that we can maybe work with that will help us get the traction once we want to get mm. the the content out or campaign out. Yeah. And on that notion of traction, what does uh, early success look like? Like, how do you know when you've kind of, you know, struck gold or maybe at least when you're heading in the right direction? It's what a, does it look like? It's it's a really good question to ask, and I get asked that a lot. So uh, when it comes to m- measuring, like, most of us in the room, unless you're like a big scale uh, MNC, we don't have the time or money to do a big uh, perception. I think we call them perception studies mm-hmm. out there, where it's very time and budget, very expensive. So one thing that we can do is we look at from a few dimensions. So first is like overall reach. Um, so whatever we're working on, like what's the actual like quantity of people that we're reaching? But And second, if it's a B2B business where we're not concerned about the masses, is it the, the right number of like are they the right audience basically so what is your reach and how you measure it is different ways so one is knowing like for example i'm getting you in front of the business times and you care about you know the business community local employers like approximately like how you know how many people are we getting that in front of you can also look at your own channels which channels that we do control so we look at like uh your google analytics how many people are visiting your website following that campaign and Look at the markets, for example, as well. If we're st- we're trying to target specific uh, specific stakeholders in certain markets, so that's that's on the reach side. And then the second is the awareness. Like those that you care about, are they coming back and saying like, okay, I I know that you know Glintz is related to HR recruitment and they specialize in X Y Z in my specific region. So are you hearing kind of the messaging and the positioning that we've been putting out, kind of echo echo back to you? I think that's quite important. And then a lot of what we do when it comes to PR is changing attitude and behavior. So, for example, um, are we trying to get people more open to, for example, fractional is becoming a very big thing in the HR world. And a lot of companies are pushing out fractional services. Like, are are we seeing more employers engaging in that? Um, and then a call to action, like, are they actually signing up for a newsletter, uh, calling our customer reps to, to learn more about us? Hmm. Okay. Okay. Then maybe I just want to ask a little bit because when ev- when people think of doing PR campaign, everyone wants to get on. I think there's a benchmark called tier one media, right? Like people kind of tier the media. Is is this true? So true. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> but it's not. It's like okay, we value. For example, a lot of the tech startups that I work with, mm. they definitely value TechCrunch. But the TechCrunch team has already been kind of. There's been a lot. Of, um, impact to the team the asia correspondent here is no longer the asia correspondent here she's actually moved on to pr actually um so media life hot life huh yeah, so, i'm sure you recognize that as well yeah. in the media world as well so it's often some of the main players are still around like for example uh for a finance clients they like the wall street journal ft reuters it's just the difference is it's just getting harder and harder to get in front of them now mm-hmm. now more than ever before um, the other thing I try to educate clients is that there are other ways to get in front of them without getting in front of them like a typical one-on-one interview. So we look for other opportunities, like, for example, opinion editorials. A lot of them are doing podcasts as well. Mm-hmm. Um, or even like lists like a Forbes 30 Under 30 or um, 
SBR has a, a list called Top 100 Startups in Southeast Asia. So finding different ways to get visibility outside of the traditional means. But again, it's like going to the gym. Where you're like constantly chipping away at it and finding different angles to get in. Mm-hmm. So when would you advise uh, your clients to kind of forget the tier one media and just look at some of the other guys first? It's hard to say no, because I also have the same ambitions for them. And I'm, of course. I'm, I'm very ambitious <laughs> myself. And, um, so it's more like, here's the program to get our um, get up to it. If, if it's a company that they would be interested in, because ultimately, like, I would tell them up front, like, actually, you know, an FTO Wall Street Journal would not be as interested in you right now because of your size. The story's not there yet. We need to build, have these building blocks get you a bit more coverage in these areas. Um, you have to show more traction. Some of the uh, top tier financial uh, financial trades, like they're asking you, like, what is your AUM if you're willing to provide that information? So it, it's a bit of an art and science. Um, obviously, I, I don't say no off the bat, but we have to figure out, like, how we can get them in front of and what are the steps uh, to do that. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, my personal question, right? So, so <laughs> I, I'm getting more and more CEOs coming on my show, right? So, yeah, like Sexo <laughs> Bank, Singtel CFO is coming, right? So, so uh, does it kind of add on to when you pitch to your client? You know, because we're not like mainstream first tier media, right? And then you talk to your client, say, hey, you know, all these guys are going on this show. Is that is that a way where you kind of position your brand also, like the brands that you represent? To, to get on. Yeah, to get on a show that other big boys are, are going on that is not tier one. Is there some sort of value to the client in that so, view? So to get on your, your yeah. like a show like yours? Yeah. So how to get like uh, high profile clients to your show? Yeah, like w- would you advise your clients to, to go on these type of shows? It, it depends on what the, the show's audience is. Um, there's a really great podcast called Analyzed Asia. I don't know if you guys, everyone's nodding. So it's it's a great podcast. And um, one of my CEOs was was on it, but he did question it quite a bit because <laughs> he, he himself may not have heard of it before. And I said, like, look, you know, it's a great show in terms of content. It goes deep. Um, it's not uh, quite like some of the uh, radio hits, like uh, won't name names. So some of the radio hits out there <laughs> are like, you know, 10, 15 minute, which is actually quite good. But like you have 45 minutes, one hour airtime, like like this type of um, platform. You can go long, and and the benefit of that is, you know, it already has the credibility because it's interviewed all these other really popular CEOs. So the FOMO effect does work in making a case to the CEO. Like, you know, your peers have been on this show. It covers really good content. This is the messaging that we would get on it. And plus, like, you know, you're getting in front of the these audience that you might care about, which could be like, in, in this case, I believe it was uh, potential investors for him as he was revving up to do fundraising. Mm-hmm. So you just have to educate and explain yeah okay fair fair let's talk c business is brought to you by glint's talent hub we understand that building a thriving business is immensely challenging it is especially intense for business leaders like yourself hence we want to journey with you glint's talent hub is the leading all-in-one solution for all your talent needs our mission is to pair you with the right talent anywhere across Southeast Asia that fits the unique needs of your business. From there, we handle all your talent management needs. We're talking talent sourcing, hiring, EOR, PEO, talent development. We have a track record of 2X faster team building and up to 70% cost savings. If you want to expand in Southeast Asia, we are your partners. Connect with us, link in the description below. curious to talk about uh local teams and the roles that uh the actual team can play in doing some of this stuff and uh particularly you know i i feel like there's a belief that you kind of need boots on the ground in some markets in order to understand those markets what's your your thought in terms of the role that the team plays in building the communications the marketing the brand the branding strategy in a way that's really tailored for a given market yeah so the, there's Two, two thoughts around that. So one is that you definitely do need local team if you're building a local PR campaign um, for a few reasons. One is local language. I don't speak Bahasa. I don't know the nuances behind Bahasa <laughs> or Vietnamese, et cetera. So I rely on my local counterparts to tell me if I'm being tone deaf. And that's something I ask right up front. Like, this is kind of what we're trying to put out there uh, from a regional house view. Does it make sense for you locally? Why or why not? So I think that's really, it's really important, especially when you're putting out lo- 
any type of local campaign. Um, where they sit, it depends on the skill set as well. So, uh, for example, if you're a regional company that has local campaigns, you still need someone that stands kind of up above that, like bird's eye view in terms of the overall communication strategy for a particular campaign. Work with the local team very closely to make sure that you are still aligned to the overall messaging. Mm. Um, thinking of an example. So, uh, for example, for the Glint's Talent Report, one of the messaging that we had is around um, the future of work and um, working remote, for example. Like, then we would talk to local teams, like, what are, like, what does working remote look to you in Indonesia, in Vietnam? And, and then, one of the, for example, one of the nuances that came out is actually it might not work as well in Vietnam because most offices are asking their employers to go back into the office. So then how do we kind of figure that out? And then what is a message that we can create that still aligns with the original message that we wanted to put out regionally? Mm. So mm -hmm. someone needs to hold a pen. If you're a regional company, someone needs to hold a pen across the, the overall communication. And then you have local teams to localize that message and make sure that you're, they're building very good local campaigns and events to help push it out. Yeah. And, and what uh, effective, I guess, feedback loops have you seen between the, the regional team and then the, maybe the team on the, in the local market? And I'm just thinking about, you know, if we're a leader listening to this and they're thinking about, okay, what's the actual structure of the team that I need to have in place to make sure that I'm getting some of that critique and feedback that you're sharing, making sure that, you know, the leader themselves is not being tone deaf in their communication. What, what are some of the dynamics that you've seen work really well in the setup of different teams again it really depends on budget and resources like i've had <laughs> you're laughing but I'm it's true because you, if you can't afford everyone you know in a local team that's quite a big comms team already right regionally most yeah. most startups and SME, uh, sme clients i've worked with they don't have a dedicated comms team unless you're like one of the bigger players big yeah. tech um out there so you have to be really resourceful. And oftentimes the head of BD or sales is your PR, POC in like Indonesia or Vietnam or the country lead, for example. So you rely and and, it, and I am so grateful for them because they have to run a business, but also look at messaging and yeah. spend time to prep to get in front of media. So, you know, oftentimes we have to be kind of resourceful in, in how we use the different players and how we equip them to do kind of their own PR yeah. in their local market. So how would you equip them? I think that's interesting. Yeah. Because <laughs> you're the professional to them, they just want to do the business and they got to do this extra thing for you. You know, so how, how, how would you get them to Offering speak? coffee or drinks is always helpful. <laughs> um, but it's also like, because at, at the end, we all have one goal um, and it's a, it's a campaign. It's a big push. It, it, I guess it depends on company culture as well. But when we're launching a regional campaign for Glitz, everyone was hands on deck. Um, whoever was the local POC, we would they would jump on regular calls with us with the local PR team. The local sometimes we do outsource some of the PR work if there isn't an internal team. So then that PR team will say, okay, th these are the do's and don'ts. This is what is relevant for media now. I think that's one of the benefits of having a PR uh, exec or team next to you because they'll tell you like whatever we wanted to talk about today is no longer relevant because this is in the news. Yeah, and because so some yeah. of the worst PR mistakes is when you're completely toned up to like what is what is happening out yeah. there. Mm -hmm. So you you rely on them to kind of keep their finger on the pulse. Yeah, and so so thinking about actually you know exactly what you're describing in terms of these media relationships and how you maintain you know a positive set of relationships with folks in the media. So it, it's it's very much an ongoing conversation and relationship as you're describing. So what does that look like in terms of brands and companies getting that right? Getting that right. The, in terms of like managing their relationships with the media. Yeah. So I think when you're starting out, what I always recommend is to figure out the top five to 10 reporters you want to get really close with. Right. And it could be international, regional, trade, local. Those, that, those are usually kind of the split that we look at. Um, and then you look at who do you care about? If it's more investors, then maybe focus on the financial trades or some of the tech trades that, that we care about. Second is to figure out beats. Um, do you, so every reporter covers a certain topic. That topic is called a beat. Yeah. Nowadays, actually, with you know what we were talking about earlier, with the landscape constantly evolving, like you have one reporter covering like multiple beats. So you have to figure out like, okay, which is the reporter actually covering the news that I want to pitch them for? Mm -hmm. And then I think 
it's always easier if if your news is not that. I mean, I think everyone thinks their news is special, but you are competing. <laughs> like you, you would have like the puck reporter. It's true. I have a lot of uh, inbound. E- they all sound like they're very excited. I'm like, nah. <laughs> Yeah, so a tip is to make sure you, you are, like, actually writing to the right person and then making sure. Actually, another, I don't, <laughs> I keep referencing Bernard, but he has this amazing list on his website about the do's and don'ts when engaging with him. And it's very, very specific <laughs> about, like, what, you know, what he expects from PR people. So it's quite refreshing, actually, because I've never seen anything like that. But at the same time, it's very clear about where, where the boundaries are and how to actually engage with him and what works. So I actually followed that format and then have gotten some clients onto his show that way. Great. Yeah. yeah. So it's just, I think that's really nice. Um, so uh, back to your question around engaging. I think ultimately, just make it non-transactional as well. Build an actual human relationship. Um, don't forget they are human. So I think a lot of times when spokespeople have interviews with the media, they forget that they are also a human. So they're just like answering questions. <laughs> so it's important to ask them about like, what stories are you covering as well? Like what other topics are you interested in? Because ultimately I think reporters remember you if you're being resourceful and, and helpful. They certainly do remember you as well if you're not being helpful or useful to them. Um, yeah, because I think a statistic I read the other day is uh, for every one reporter, there's at least like six more than six PR person, probably even more than that today with everything that's happening. So they're getting inundated with emails and requests. So how do you kind of stand out from the crowd? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I mean, I, I can add a little bit on that, right? I mean, I, I don't run the first tier media. I run a long form talk show. But it tends to be that the PR guys will just send me a template email that they send everyone. I, I, I look at it and I know, right? It's like, this is pretty much bumped to everybody, right? And... I think from from just to add some color into this changing media landscape where you know creators can do their own shows, right? Um, I don't need I don't run a lot of beats, so I don't need a lot of things, you know. Uh, and so when you come to me, you need to be crafted, right? You need to be clear of like like there is a parameter, like okay, this show, yeah, what is this show? But I was just going to ask you, like, how do I pitch you? Yeah, my <laughs> yeah, I, exactly, right. So so I mean, uh, I I someone told me about that, so I will get down to that. You know, having <laughs> a very clear pitch because if not, and it, it adds a lot on your work to study the show to know what ticks the show, right? So I I could definitely save some time. I actually find that, that quite fun. rewarding. I love yeah. to dig deep. I like to really understand like if editorial genders are changing, how they're changing. Um, who, which reporters are new? When they're new, they're great because you can. They're open. They're way more open because they're not busy or inundated with emails like yet. So when they're new, you're like, oh, I have so and so that I think would be great because they can talk about X, Y, and Z. Like, can you know, are you open for a coffee? So I'm not. I'm not hard selling the business or anything yet. It's just more like have a coffee. But with the spokesperson, I'm having a totally different conversation. Like you're meeting with this reporter, you get this. And again, I don't tell them to sell the business, but they care about these topics. Like, make sure you work in, like, how you fit into these topics, how you work into their ecosystem, etc. So, it's, <laughs> so it's a casual coffee, but at the same time, you're you're working hard to build that relationship because, again, there aren't as many reporters out there anymore. So it's really important to be very strategic in how you approach them because they will remember. They will remember if you've any if you said anything or mucked up anything. They, they'll just go to the next person or your competitor. Yeah, fair. Especially if you spam me with emails. Spam, don't spam. Don't <laughs> yeah, yeah. Be very careful about yeah. that. Yeah. But 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 I, I want to ask a little bit more on on the idea of building up your client profile, right? Because of course, as they get stronger and uh, become a talk of the town, they they become an authority figure. They they go they can go anywhere, right? Uh, every show will be like, come, come, right? It's it's a very different uh, dynamics by that, yeah. right? So, so how do you get the- yeah? Yeah, how do you get there? Um, so as the company gets bigger, the usually gets bigger and they also kind of diversify into different services and products. Usually they also bring more people in. You try to identify the people that would be strong spokespeople and kind of what they would be. Because not every show needs the CEO or the founder. If it's a CTO focused show or a podcast or interview, then you're going to have to get your CTO prepped. So you, you kind of figure out like who you can work with, get them trained up, and then start building out uh, communications or adding that into your communications program so you don't overly rely on the CEO because usually as the company gets bigger, he also he or she also gets busier as well. So you have to be quite mindful of that, I think. Awesome. 
And would just love to get your perspective on for business leaders tuning into this, any advice in terms of where to start? Because we've covered a lot today and I just want to make sure our listeners, you know, have a little have have some thoughts in terms of maybe the initial steps when trying to figure all this out. Call me. <laughs> <laughs> Um, okay, so I think when you're trying to figure this out, you start with figuring out who who do you most care about, prioritize your stakeholders, is it talent, is it investors, is it customers, and then based on that, then start creating, like if it's, for example, customer, what does that customer profile look like, and then from there, what do they care about reading, and and then you figure out or map out the, the right reporters and media that would fit that scope, yes. and then you figure out. I, I do read a lot of emails or see them on social media about like just very uncouth ways to approach media. So I think, and it's hard for me to articulate, but I'm, you know, it's important to be human and empathetic to the reporter and not just demand things. I think that's really important when engaging with media. Awesome. Well, thank you. Thank you. And would love to open it up uh, to the audience and any questions in the room. Question? Oh, you have a question. Okay. No, I think it's important for us to always be in the know about who's, who's now out there. Um, so I, it's important to do your homework and they do the, the ones that matter. I think often resurface or if I'm speaking to media, like who, who are you, who are you guys talking to or who's out there? Um, so it ultimately like depends on figure out who they are and then seeing if they are actually relevant to the client. A lot of the creators currently or may not necessarily be aligned to what our clients can talk about or, or, and the client may not be relevant to what they want to talk about as well. Um, again, Bernard is a really good example of a creator that's actually created something that's very substantial. We vet them accordingly, like who's listening to them, what does the listenership look like, what topics are they covering before we even present it to the particular client. Um, and I, I think the second thing is because I do work a lot with startups, it's worth experimenting. And if it doesn't work out, it doesn't work out, we'll just iterate, try something different um, if they're open to it. Questions? <laughs> it was something that I was actually facing a bit when I worked in China as well, the red pockets. Um, for it depends on like the ethics or uh, behind like my company or the companies I've worked with. We usually haven't really engaged in those. Um, typically, if they're reputable, um, they they tend to not ask for additional expense money. <laughs> um, and I think the other thing is like making sure that you're helping with any reporter, actually media, you try to make sure that you're packaging things that are easy for them to write about. And it's not self-serving. If it's self-serving, what, what more I get confronted with is like, you know, this is not, this is more for a sponsorship. Do you want to do a sponsorship? Yeah. Which is totally legit. <laughs> um, but otherwise it's like, you make sure you package it uh, as nicely as you could. Um, one thing that I thought was really interesting that we did in Indonesia a while back with a, a rural e-commerce startup called Daganan is that we offered media tours of their facilities. So I think ultimately, like a reporter should be very curious about these things and they should see it as a great learning. We didn't really expect media coverage. It was just for them to learn about the different warungs and the distributors and the wholesalers, like the whole ecosystem. Uh, and we took them on that tour and we got a lot of interest off the back of that and, and actually good coverage as well locally. Nice. So I think think about the packaging and the experience that you're bringing them, and if it, and if it's just a flat, like we you know we want additional budget, I I think it's safe to say no or try some, somewhere else, or or create your own media. <laughs> Since we're all creators here. <laughs> fair, fair. I like that. Actually, I th that was some of the best experiences when when it is not like just an email that come in that says oh we're doing this blah, 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 and I expect you to publish something. It's more like, oh, you know, we have this thing. Could you come for an event or, or something, right? And then, you know, media people always like to go for an event, right? And then they just yeah. go there, get a good sense, and then probably write something about it. And yeah, it, It's worth the time and effort that this, you know, C-suite or, or the business leaders put in because it also comes in handy, and this is not something we've covered today, but it comes in handy when stuff hits the fan. And so before they report, they'll think about, like, let's get their side of the story they'd be a bit more empathetic to your side if they already know you for if you ever have to deal with uh, issues or crisis at the company hopefully no one does but usually as you get bigger that's there's always it's it's a good learning experience i would say fair fair cool that's it okay 
Awesome. Uh, well, thank you, Peggy. I think it's really uh, helpful to have your perspectives in terms of really building this PR strategy. I know I walked away with a lot of perspectives uh, just in terms of keeping that end audience in mind, never forgetting that, you know, that human touch in terms of there being a real person on the other end of, of these conversations, uh, as well as many, many other things. So really appreciate you joining us today and sharing your perspectives. Thanks for having me.